And I think we need to take a step back and think about what's actually happening. Okay, fine, we've been told it's progressive, we've been told it's a new kind of paradigm of gay rights. That's not actually what is happening here. And we need to think about that vulnerable child at the centre of this. And I would add as well, like the school has a duty of care to that child, but it also has a duty of care to the other children in that classroom, the cohort. What are we saying to children when we say, all the adults in this room, everyone you trust, is telling you now to say that this little girl who was your best friend, who was your best friend, is now a boy. This is, you know, it's, it's, it's deeply damaging to children to do that. Hi everyone, you're very welcome back to Grip Media. I'm your host, Maria Means, and today I'm joined in studio by Leisha Iota de Bruyne. Leisha is the founder and CEO of an organisation called The Countess, a group which seeks to inform the Irish public about the impacts of the 2015 Gender Recognition Act. She is also a barrister of law and she joins me now to talk about the Gender Recognition Act and its impacts, transgender ideology in schools, International Women's Day, women's only spaces and more. Welcome Leisha, would you start by just briefly introducing yourself and giving us an outline of who the Countess are and the work that you do as an organisation? Thank you very much for having me on. Um, my name is Leisha Ada de Bruyne um, and I am the CEO and founder of the Countess. Um, and I founded the Countess actually in secret three years ago online um, and we launched in September 2020. And we are a apolitical, non-partisan, single issue organisation. Um, we are voluntary. Um, we have, you know, about 35 volunteers working now full time pretty much with us. Um, and our core mission is to highlight the impact of gender ideology or trans ideology, you can call it, um, and the Gender Recognition Act um, on women and children, but also on vulnerable LGB young people and society as a whole. We view this very much as a radical reordering of society that no one voted for, that there's no mandate for, that's deeply unpopular. Um, and we've weathered a lot of flack, you know, to get to this stage where people are discussing this openly. Um, but our core mission is to protect and um, promote the rights of women and children in Ireland. So the big talking point this week, Leisha, has been education. We saw our Taoiseach Leo Varadkar come out and say that children in primary schools, he said, quote, that the education system in Ireland needed to prepare children for the world, that children should be taught transgender theory. What do you make of his comments? I just find it extraordinary that not only um, Leo Varadkar, but like minister after minister, is coming out um, parroting the lines really that have been fed to them by, um, I'm afraid to say, the trans lobby groups. Um, this is just indicative of the huge disconnect between um, government and people on the ground in Ireland and parents and what they actually care about. Um, you know, there's been absolute outpouring of concern and um, just outcry from parents who you know, they entrust their children to schools to be educated. And, and, and what, what do we mean when we say they should be prepared for the world? What we mean is they need to ha have, you know, ideally a leaving cert and life skills and, um, you know, confidence to go out there into the world. And transgender ideology is incredibly harmful for society, but it also um, is predicated on homophobia, on sexist stereotyping, on a pseudo-religion which has no basis in science, um, which contradicts the science curriculum. It has no place in schools whatsoever and we are calling very strongly to end this indoctrination of school children. It is not what schools are for. And Leisha, we also had another senior politician, the Children's Minister, Roderick O'Gorman. He said that primary school children should be taught, quote, what it means to be trans. There's obviously been some pushback to this. We saw the Catholic Primary Management Association hit out at this and they said there's no social consensus, there's no scientific consensus for this. And then we had the Irish Muslim Council also come out and say this would be inappropriate. So, I mean, is it, is it correct to say that we are seeing big levels now of pushback to this? Yes, and, um, you know, we really welcome the two, those two different faiths coming forward and um, very clearly and very succinctly making the argument that this has no place in schools. Um, you know, we would like to think that we are um, a huge part of the reason that there is a pushback to begin with. Um, you know, thousands of parents used our toolkit for the NCCA submission around this issue and it looks like we have had um, a, a gain there, a, a slight victory insofar as it has been watered down. We haven't seen the exact document yet, but uh, we're hopeful. Um, 
But, you know, on a bigger, wider scale, what this means is that the politicians are being put on notice. The government is being put on notice. Like, this is deeply unpopular, um, this ideology. And I think, as well, you know, what we try and do, really, our mission as an organisation is we empower parents. That's kind of our ever evergreen campaign is to empowering parents. And we, we remind them and ask them, really, to step into their power. They have really robust rights in Ireland under our constitution and under the Education Act 1998. And all they need to do is remind their schools of those rights um, with regard to their primacy as the educators of their own children. And Alicia, where would you say that this advocacy from our government is coming from? We've seen a lot of proposals around this sort of thing um, because obviously it can't be from young kids. It can't be from even teenagers. They're not even old enough to smoke or, or drink or anything like that. So why is this being advocated for at such a high level and where do you think the push is coming from? Uh, I think it's uh, undoubtedly from the NGO sector, sector um, and specifically from the LGBTQI um, sector within, within the NGO um, kind of, you know, industrial complex. Um, they're very well funded and in fact they're using our taxpayer, taxpayers' money to essentially push out this doctrine and this ideology which is deeply unpopular and after all you know where's the mandate for this like Irish people have never been asked if they want this to be taught in schools um, and, and luckily we are seeing a huge pushback uh, we've actually um, uh, just dropped yesterday on our website template letters that we want parents to use because not everyone will come at this from the same angle I think that's really important to to um, put out there, you know, some people will have religious views around this. Some people uh, might and it might not come from that viewpoint at all. They just might have a huge growing disquiet and um, a resistance towards this. Um, you know, from our point of view, we would kind of offer a feminist framework to um, to look at trans ideology. And so, we, but we have two template letters, that just very simple. They remind parents of their rights and how they basically do not consent to the indoctrination of their children. Of course, there is also a level of support out there for this, for transgender ideology to be taught even in primary schools. Maybe from some parents, a lot of this support would come from LGBT plus organisations. One of those organisations recently responded to this criticism of the government. Uh, it was an organisation called Belong To. They responded by saying, quote, Trans young people are in primary schools in Ireland, ignoring their existence and silencing conversations around identity will have detrimental effects on the lives of these pupils. How would you respond to that? What do you make of that? Well, firstly, I would say that there's no such thing as a trans child. Uh, what we are seeing across Ireland in classrooms all over Ireland, not just in Dublin, in the countryside, everywhere, is uh, social contagion. So. Um, you know, this is a social phenomenon that is being spread largely online um, and is not helpful to affirm these children. It's certainly not a neutral act. It's not a harm-free option. It's not risk-free. In fact, it's a powerful therapeutic intervention and should only be undertaken under the supervision of um, a psychologist or a psychotherapist. It has no place in schools. Teachers are risking liability down the line should they socially transition children, and they should think really long and hard before they do that. Despite what's happening in the courts in Ireland currently, there is no legal obligation to socially transition a child, as things stand, under either the Equal Status Act um, or under any other legislation, including the Gender Recognition Act. So I think teachers can take heart, and so should parents. And if children are suffering from that, they need our support. It's progressive, we've been told it's a new kind of paradigm of gay rights, that's not actually what is happening here. And we need to think about that vulnerable child at the centre of this. Um, and I would add as well, like the school has a duty of care to that child, but it also has a duty of care to the other children in that classroom, the cohort. You know, what are we telling, the, what are we saying to children when we say, all the adults in this room, everyone you trust, is telling you now to say that this little girl who was your best friend, who was your best friend, is now a boy. This is, you know, it's, it's, it's deeply damaging to children to do that. Um, and I would say as well, in terms of primary school children, you know, if you roll out trans ideology and this idea that a boy can be a girl and a girl can be a boy, as we saw in the infamous Into video, which by, by the way, they've pulled from their website, but you know, it's, it's still there. It's used as resources to train t t teachers. So if you say to a small child, you know what, you're a girl, but you can be a boy. 
or vice versa. You're disrupting an actual critical stage of development in that child's life. Because sex is not permanent in a child's mind until they're seven, six or seven, it depends. So up until that moment, they actually believe that if they put like a dress on G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe becomes a girl. If they put a, you know, G.I. Joe's clothes on Barbie, Barbie becomes a boy. So you're disrupting that very critical stage of development. And I think, you know, we do so at our peril. With regards to education, I know we've been talking there, Alicia, maybe about very young children, but there also have been proposals for secondary education. The NCCA have proposed um, different changes. The new curriculum, curriculum is currently being drafted. And I know your organisation has spoken out against these proposed changes to secondary education. Would you talk us through just a few of the things that are being uh, promoted there that are being proposed? Uh, gender identity is seen as a given and going to be taught as a fact. Um, now we did um, release a toolkit for parents to use and I'm happy to say they did use it. You know, It was used um, in their hundreds if not thousands and it was the biggest response that the NCCA had in terms of um, objections to their draft curricula was on this topic of gender ideology. So I'd like to think that that is the footprint of you know, the Countess with regard to our kind of grassroots uh, organising and, act and um, activism on the ground. Um, so our key concerns would be that it embeds gender identity theory into the curriculum. Another tool they're using which I think is uh, hugely concerning is the merger of SPHE and RSE. And one of those can be taught throughout the day and the other one has to be taught in a specific lesson. But if they are merged as they intend to do, and if gender identity theory is part of this curriculum, what that means is then, even if you want to take your child out and use the opt-out clause, you won't be able to because you won't know. It'll be logistically impossible to know when your child is going to be taught this theory. And like, when you look at the resources, it's quite chilling. You know, they'll say things like, oh, history lesson, this is a good time to talk about trans ideology. Was Joan of Arc actually trans? You know, and that's there in black and white as an idea, as an opener for a teacher in front of a classroom. Um, what we're seeing is that schools are going to, are, are, there's an attempt to use schools and in fact teachers as educators to use them as, you know, tools of indoctrination. And that is simply wrong. And not only with regard to gender identity ideology, but in terms of the senior cycle curriculum, what, what it also is predicated on are really radical theories like queer theory, like critical justice, social justice theory. Um, you know, these are very fringe, very hard left, very abstract sort of post-structuralist theories that I think that if Irish parents actually sat down and read about them, they would just be so shocked. I mean, queer theory, for instance, would be hugely concerning because at its heart is a breaking down of all boundaries and norms in society, including the innocence of childhood. So, you know, we have essentially the capture of the NCCA by this ideology and because of that then, it's been run by activists who are pushing these extremely radical um, ideas and concepts and you know, implanting them into the school's curriculum. Leisha, this week also saw, I know you were talking there about your consultation guide, and there were up to, I think, 4,353 submissions from parents, and that's an awful lot regarding the secondary curriculum and the NCCA. Um, Parents, however, have sort of come out now and they've claimed that they feel as though even though they responded to the consultation process, they've been ignored, they've been dismissed, very much in favour of an emphasis being given from the NCCA to certain groups, certain NGOs. Would you say that parents are sort of being pushed aside? I mean, absolutely. I mean, we wrote as an organisation to the NCCA uh, in the aftermath of their published consultation. And the point that we picked up on specifically was how they characterised those responses. You know, it was uh, slightly disdainful. They said things like, oh, we're not sure is this a petition style approach to, um, you know, this work. And I would say, yes, it was. It's called grassroots organising. It's called giving ordinary people the toolkit and the language to make their voices heard. So, so, is, so, so what is the point here? Is the point that um, the NGO sector, which is funded after all by our taxes, they can recruit graduates from you know, the social sciences and they can pay them salaries and those uh, workers, like paid workers, so they can sit in an office all day reading through this incredibly turgid, esoteric um, you know, documents 
and coming up with pointers and coming up with talking points. But we as volunteers who are mostly, most of us are mothers, we're juggling households, jobs, that we can't spend our time and our brain work doing the same thing and, allow, you know, and building up resources and toolkits for ordinary people to use. And that's somehow, you know, not democratic. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I, I find that so insulting and so elitist to say that ordinary people can't um, organise around the, the, these issues when they matter so dearly to them. I mean, this goes to the heart of society. What are our children going to be taught in schools? You know, I, I just feel so strongly that we need, we must act and we must resist the indoctrination of a whole generation. And with regards to parents, I know one of the things that the Countess have come out and said is that you are concerned about parents' rights being eroded, that children will have to attend these classes and these lessons, even if parents are not in agreement. We did have the Education Minister, Norma Foley, come out and give an assurance that parents would still have the rights, that children would not be forced to attend such lessons. Do you have trust in that promise to parents from the Minister? Look, I think um, with regard to the opt-out clause, um, firstly, it doesn't solve the problem we're trying to solve here. Because, you know, what we're talking about is indoctrination. So clearly, if half the class leave for that lesson, let's say, for instance, you know, st they're still going to talk about what they've just heard in class. Of course they, of course they will. But, you know, we're hearing a lot from parents who are concerned that taking their child out stigmatises the child. And like, after all, children don't want to be the one or two, you know, they don't want to be the odd one out. They don't want to be different. Um, so our concern is that it's not, it doesn't go anywhere close to um, offsetting the breach of parental rights. I mean, I think that's why it's there. I think it's quite cynical to a degree because um, Norma Foley knows well that parents do have absolute primacy both under a statute and under the constitution in terms of the, being their own children's educator. But the opt-out clause is not, uh, it's not good enough. Um, and also, as I said earlier, if um, RSE and SPHE are merged, the opt-out clause will be rendered redundant really because you will never know when your child is gonna be taught this ideology anyway, because it'll be sort of sprinkled throughout the school day. So I wanted to ask you, you know, as a woman, as a mother, I think we're seeing so much in our culture and in our society that, you know, this, I suppose, promotion of transgenderism and the concept that a man can be a woman, that, you know, a man, a biological man can go through the same uh, life experiences as a woman. What do you make of that? So, like, a good way to kind of describe how we view this is, um, you know, the other day, uh, the Dáil, the, the Women's Caucus in the Dáil, chose to platform and centre a male trans activist. And we're seeing a lot of this. And, and what that means is, you know, it's kind of like the, these, these male trans activists are wheeled out as a sort of shorthand um, or totem for diversity. You know, they're kind of, we're told, we're meant to believe that there are other types of women and, you know, their struggle is as real as ours. Like, I've no doubt that if you have gender dysphoria, it must be absolutely a nightmare. Um, and if you choose to have, you know, dental surgery, I mean, that's just, um, it's absolutely, um, you know, I would have nothing but sympathy for those people who take that step and take it that far. But really what we're seeing is an erasure of not only the rights of women, but our lived experience, you know, the, the, our experience, you know, they've never, They'll never experience the biological or structural constraints, you know, that women face. You know, they're never going to, like, women have to um, carry the mother load, you know, all the kind of schools, admin and the dental appointments, the doctor's appointments, running households, caring for elderly relatives, you know, motherhood itself, childbirth, pregnancy, breastfeeding, you know, being up all night with a sick child, taking time off work to look, look after that sick child. Like, these are all the things that women deal with and I think up to now really just got on with you know I just think there was a sense that we got on with it and the fact now that we have we're living in this new world where we're told that men who identify as women you know they like that being a woman is just an identity and that none of this matters and that we can somehow erase biology I think it's deeply insulting to women and I think particularly in Ireland you know in our lineage like women 
have put up with a lot in this country. Um, you know, one of our most successful campaigns was to retain the word woman in maternity legislation in Ireland. Um, and we launched a campaign called These Words Belong to Us. And I feel it's really important to say that out loud, you know, mother, woman, female, girl. These words don't belong to the state, they belong to us. I want to talk a little bit about the 2015 Gender Recognition Act. Your organisation, a big aim that you have is to inform people about the impact of this act. Would you maybe just guide us through some of the things that have changed since that legislation was passed that people might not be aware of? So um, it was brought in in 2015, the Gender Recognition Act. Uh, it's an extraordinary piece of legislation. Um, even to this day, when I read it, you know, eight years later, it's just, um, it's just shocking. It says, you know, that uh, once you, under the effects of the gender recognition certificate being given to someone, uh, once you uh, acquire a certificate, what it says is that your sex changes, so that you, you know, you become the gender that you wish to be, but that your sex, if your sex was that of male, it, it will become female. Now, you know, the gender recognition certificate is not a magic wand. Nobody can change sex. Every single strand of DNA, every cell remains either male or female. Um, so it's true that some people may want to present as the opposite sex, they may want to go about their lives socially as the opposite sex, but our concern, our core concern is how this impacts the spaces and places and parts and interfaces of society where sex matters. Things like single sex provision, prisons, toilets, changing rooms, sports. So Basically what it does is, if a man at any moment can identify into a female-only space, that female-only space or service or sport becomes de facto mixed sex. It no longer becomes just for us, just for, for women or for girls. So that is at a, that's a huge catastrophic erosion of women's rights, but also of ch child safeguarding. Um, I do believe that it was brought in from a place of compassion. Um, you know, I think that there was a lack of understanding about how it would actually bed down in a practical sense. Mm. And there was a huge amount of lobbying, you know. Um, and, and I think, you know, at the time, policymakers, legislators felt this is a way to, um, you know, be at the forefront of th this new international um, human rights paradigm. Mm. But really, I think it's fair to say at this stage, all reasonable people can see the obvious issues with allowing any man who wants to, to identify into a female-only space. And I would say as well, with regard to the Gender Recognition Act in particular, which is uh, what I would call full self-ID, there's no gatekeeping built in there. So with the medical model, uh, which is more popular and more you know, commonly used around the world, you have you know, a panel of doctors or lawyers who are essentially keeping this mechanism away from the types of men who you wouldn't want to acquire it. Whereas in Ireland, you know, we allow men who are in remand from rape for rape to acquire a gender recognition certificate. So through, you know, during their trial, they can be advised by counsel, uh, if you want to not go to Mount Joy and go to um, the Women's Women Limerick, just say that you are actually suffering from gender dysphoria or you identify as a woman. And you know, there's no gatekeeping, so it's literally fill out a form, make a solemn declaration, whatever that means, and you, you get to um, legally change your sex in this country. Um, and we would, be calling for that to be amended um, as a matter of urgency, really, to close the gaps. You know, it is unconscionable that there, there are, as I speak to you here today, that there are violent sex offenders in the women's wing in Limerick, housed with the most vulnerable women in the world who, after all, have experienced a lifetime of male abuse. And I think just to clarify there, Alicia, I, it's important for people to know that, you know, if I was a man, I can walk into an office of the state and I can fill out a form and... The big thing I think people might not know is that you don't actually have to have taken any female hormones. You don't have to have altered yourself physically in any way or had surgery or anything like that. So that's a big thing, isn't it? That people might not be aware of, that there's no physical changes a lot yeah. of the time. I think, I think that's the key. I think, I think you know, what you said there is critical. So I think that in the common imagination, there's a sense that these are um, you know, highly vulnerable um, let's say, effeminate, proto-gay men who uh, are one of the girls who want to be uh, women who, you know, th and that cohort always existed and we used to call them transsexuals and they had the full genital surgery and they wanted to pass as female. That's not what modern day trans activism is about. 
modern day transactivism, what we have embedded into law here in Ireland, is the right of any man who wants to, for any reason at all, identify as a woman. And of course then we leave the gate open for, you know, the predators, for the chancers, for the fetishists, for the transgressors, for the men who just want to access that space. You know, um, and I think it's time to really close those gaps and um, go back to you know, the most basic common sense instruments of safeguarding that we always had in society and that we've just, um, in the space of 10 years, you know, just decided we didn't need anymore. You know, we'd all love to live in a world where there was no male violence against women and children, but you know, we are where we are and we just need to um, have these, uh, you know, the, these mechanisms in society where we separate the sexes, particularly where we, women are vulnerable. You mentioned there about closing the gaps. I think we've seen that happen in, in the UK very recently, like in the na last number of days, where in prisons there, the government have brought in a rule where if you still have male genitalia or if you're in prison for a violent crime or a sex crime, you will not be allowed to be housed in a female prison. Do you think Ireland should follow that, could follow that? Yes, well, I mean, I'm heartened by um, increasing numbers of TDs and senators speaking out on this issue. Um, I, thought, I, found, I found it extraordinary when, you know, Nicola Sturgeon essentially lost not only the leadership of her party, but probably independence for a whole generation for Scotland over this issue. Because when it came to it, she couldn't defend it. She couldn't defend the policy and she couldn't define the policy either. You know, she just dissembled when she was asked, well, wait now, if that man is not a woman and he said he was, then... Who is? You know, what's the test? And she couldn't really defend it. But I, what, I, what I found was noteworthy was at this very same time, the mainstream media here were pretty silent, really, I would say, on the elephant in the room, which is that in Ireland, we've been, you know, we, we have adopted the exact same policy of allowing men, even rapists, to identify into female prisons in this country. And we've been doing that since uh, the Gender Recognition Act was brought into um, in, in 2015. So actually what we're seeing in Ireland and elsewhere are the most terrifyingly dangerous, ultra-violent men, uh, sexual predators, are the ones who are trying, are using this and abusing this system to get into um, the female estate. It's not going to go away. There's just going to be a stream of these men. How do you deal? How do we deal with this? You know, in Limerick with these men, and we heard from the excellent Paddy O'Gorman podcast the psychological impact it's having on these women. Yeah. You know, they're hearing sexualized catcalling and abuse mm -hmm. from these men all day long. You know, and that's under the care and duty of the state. It's just not good enough. I think quite an extraordinary situation to a lot of people that are going to be listening to this. Um, you were talking about women's spaces. Another area I think that that sort of goes into is sports. And we recently saw the GAA, ladies GAA, um, come out and support a transgender policy. That was only like last week um, or the week before. That, I think, apart from even people who might have any really care about this issue at all ideologically, I think the big concern there from people even on the fence is that it could just be dangerous, you know, plainly dangerous for women to be playing alongside men. Yes, I think it's dangerous. I think it's, um, it's deeply unfair. And, I mean, I think the reason that World Rugby um, did the great work that they did with their symposium um, and then that obviously that instruct that um, and guidance has been fed down to the national governing bodies and the IRFU has come out very much on the side on the side of fairness versus inclusivity um, sadly uh, as you said uh, ladies um, Gaelic Football Association has not they've chosen inclusivity over fairness and I would say to really any national governing bodies in sport you know it's it's a, it is a binary choice a bit like sex it's binary you have to choose either inclu inclusivity or fairness because gender identity doesn't play, you know identities don't play sport bodies play sport and we we're all aware we don't even need to debate the um, advantage that male puberty bestows on on men and boys you know in terms of speed and power and, and muscle mass and weight um, you know we separate the sexes for a reason in sport because otherwise it's unfair and like really what it does to female sport is it, it it denigrates it to a participation only sport and I think that's so insulting to women who play sport at all levels be it recreational be it uh, competitive competitive be it elite um, and I also would push back about any sort of argument that oh at the recreational level or the community level it's okay to do this because it doesn't really matter we'll just keep it separate 
you know, will protect the category of sex um, at a high level. You know, this all feeds into the same thing. You can't just take off one, one strata of sport because it'll all impact, it impacts up. Um, I mean, in terms of the, um, like we have this, the Cantus has a working group on sport um, and it's very, very active. We have former elite athletes in there and women who do play um, and who, who do coach um, Gaelic. And, you know, our members have come to us saying that they felt like they were punched in the stomach because it's only a generation that women can actually play this sport. You know, they weren't able, there was two, there, you know, they were, they were washing the jerseys and, um, you know, helping out in the, you know, be, behind the scenes. And it has seen a huge upsurge in the sport. And I feel like um, it's an extraordinary kind of tone deaf yeah. move. Um, and the timing is also very odd, you know, in terms of um, Sport Ireland and what they're doing at the moment. So um, it was very disappointing, but equally as well, I think, you know, I'm an optimist. And sometimes when there's such an out overreach like this, um, that is so clearly so out of touch with the, with the, you know, with the actual players and supporters, yeah. sometimes you know, it can bring more people into the argument and open more eyes and that's a good thing. If I'm correct, there's also a push from certain politicians in our government to limit the age for gender self-ID. So like 16 year olds can self-ID, they don't need parental consent to do so. Um, with regards to that, there was a Professor Donal O'Shea, he is part of the National Gender Unit, he's a consultant, like a top doctor, and he came out on News Talk very recently and said this is very dangerous. Were you surprised to hear, you know, such a senior doctor come out so strongly? Do you know what I felt actually, um, when I read that quote, I was like, you know, he's, he's actually, he's had enough, you know, he's yeah. been trying to walk a very uh, careful, narrow path, and now he's basically just gonna come out and say it. And what he said was extraordinary. He said that, you know, a clinician um, like myself, who's been doing this, and it's a very niche part of medicine, obviously, gender um, medicine, who's been, you know, he's at the top of his field at, in a very niche, specialized area of medicine. As a clinician, he's not being listened to. Mm -hmm. You know, the policy makers, policies have been driven by activists. Um, yeah. I think it was a warning shot, and I think, um, it's indicative of what's happening across the board. I mean, if we look at education, if we look at all these different bills that are being pushed, the suite of bills, um, you know, the, the, the people, I think these policies are being driven by trans lobby groups whose framework is not legally or medically sound. And I think it's clear from what he said that the government is not willing to listen to doctors, to medical professionals. They want to go with, run with the activist view. Why do you think that is? I think that the advocacy and lobbying that's been done has been done very, very well. I also think as well, it's probably, we're possibly vulnerable to this because of our history, because I think that there's a sense that, you know, this is a, after like the same-sex marriage referendum, which was a landslide, and which you know we as an organization would have welcomed massively there was a sense that okay what can we do next you know what can we do next to to kind of um fly that flag mm -hmm. um and self-id was latched onto this yeah. um in people's minds and also kind of um i think it's fair to say legis legislatively so i feel like a lot of this is kind of um a sense of you know we've in government certainly there's a kind of intoxication with this vision of ourselves as this ultra progressive country but without pausing to think wait now what does this ideology actually say about women how does it actually treat um vulnerable lgb same-sex attracted young people um you know is the affirmation model uh you know proven you know it's not i mean i read something only yesterday that after full surgery you know the full physical transformation gen you know genital surgery mm -hmm that there's a 19 times higher risk of self-harm, self um, of, of suicide ideation. Mm -hmm. So there will often be a honeymoon period, particularly when we see young girls take testosterone, um, because it does give you that sort of bounce initially. But um, long term, you know, there is, there is no, no science to back up transition whatsoever. And you were on the GRIP podcast with John quite recently. And I think one of the really interesting things that you said, you went into just what you were talking about, the actual reality off these puberty blockers. Um, Professor Donal O'Shea, he was another person who said 
actually this isn't really evidence-based even though this has been sort of gone with but in terms of the puberty blockers would you talk a little bit about for example the impact of a young girl going on testosterone because I think so many of us don't really realise what what that leads to what that means and we need to be informed. The sort of official narrative that we hear about puberty blockers is that it's sort of time to think pause, you know time to mm. pause um, that's been firmly debunked because um, even in the Tavistock itself, itself, yeah. their own studies showed that you know there was for the cohort who were on puberty blockers, you know, almost all of them went on to sex cross hormones. So you were already sort of on that treadmill, so to speak. Um, so in terms of a, say a young girl who's on testosterone, um, within three months on taking that cross sex hormone as a patch or however she takes it she will have male pattern baldness for life. She will have hair on her back and her chest for life. Mm -hmm. Her voice will have broken down to, um, there's a video currently online that shows their these young girls, their voices getting lower and lower and lower and lower until it's affected, it is a man's voice. Mm -hmm. And that is irreversible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the fact that we're allowing this to happen um, is, is, you know, it's the biggest medical scandal of the age. Mm -hmm. It's not clear how long this will, how long this takes, but they will end up sterile. And when I say sterile, I mean sterile. I don't mean infertile. I mean sterile because of the damage it does to the female reproductive organs. Because obviously the vast majority of these young people are on the autistic spectrum. Um, and not only that, but up to about 80% um, of p young, young boys and girls who are questioning their identity, who say they want to transition, they will just end up as uh, same-sex attracted. So if we're placing those young people who are vulnerable, who typically will have a comorbidity of other mental health issues like self-harm, like eating disorders, um, quite often there's a, you know, a timeline of trauma, um, sexual abuse, I'm afraid to say as well, which if you think about this, it's, it makes sense that you would hate the body that you're in and want to dissociate from that body. Um, but the problem with, the, with affirming those young people is that all of those other issues get swept under the carpet and the affirmation, the transition is seen as the silver bullet that solves all those problems. I want to talk a little bit about this whole concept of transphobia, especially when it comes to young people and teenagers. I think at that age there is definitely more of a peer pressure and kids want to be liked. Would you say that with young people at the minute there is quite a big pressure on them to go along with this and go along with, for example, transgender terminology? Yes, I think that, um, unfortunately, it's seen as being kind, you know, the whole be kind um, and, and any kind of pushback has up until now certainly been classified, you know, characterised as transphobia. But I have to say, I do think the term transphobia is losing its power because like anything, if everything is transphobic, if me sitting here today on International Women's Day saying that I'm a woman um, and that a man cannot be a woman, if that's transphobic, you know, if me talking about, you know, pregnancy or childbirth or um, if any woman discussing the realities of their lives is transphobic, yeah. like then everything is transphobic. Mm, um, so I think, I think it's losing its power. I'd like to think as well, you know, this is after, after all a kind of social phenomenon first and foremost. Uh, well, it's also a profit-driven movement, you know, um, it, it sort of presents itself as a human rights or, um, um, you know, mo international movement or civil rights movement, but in actual fact, it's, it's driven by profit. I mean, that's another point to remember as well, always, that like every child that's put on uh, the protocol of hormones, um, you know, that nets big pharma, you know, millions of dollars. So you made the point, you pointed out a statistic where in the last 20 years, there has been a 5,000% increase in the number of young girls who have uh, wanted to identify as boys. I mean, that is huge. Why, why do you think we're seeing so many, especially young girls, not want to be girls? So I think um, the important thing to note is that there's always been a cohort um, um, of little boys typically uh, who wanted to be girls um, and they would normally present between ages two and four and that 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 was a tiny 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 percentage 0.01% um, of the population but now what we're seeing is a huge increase 
in young people wanting to transition. But of that huge increase, which is nearly 5,000%, 80% of them are girls. Um, and they typically won't have had any, there's no evidence of them having any gender dysphoria in early childhood or in later childhood. It just suddenly comes on. It's called rapid onset gender dysphoria. And it's a phenomenon that we're seeing amongst girls in the Anglophone world, in America, in Australia, in Canada, in Ireland. Um, it's very clear to anyone paying close attention that this, these same girls, you know, a generation ago would have been maybe self-harming or they would have had bulimia. Um, teenage girls, historically, you know, going back to the Salem witch, tri witch trials, they, they're very good at expressing each other's, the collective um, psychic distress. And that's what they do. And that's why we're, we're, we're witnessing is social contagion. Because amongst that cohort, if one girl says, oh, this, if she frames her confusion and distress in these terms, well then all the other girls in that group, the peers will latch onto this. And so what we're really seeing is in terms of the figures is, you know, this is just the thing, you know, it would have been a different thing in a different era because teenage girls, it's something, this is what they do. But I would say as well um, that unfortunately because of the impact of porn on society, you know, the same young girls are living through the porn age. The dig digital yeah. age is the porn age. Mm -hmm. And no wonder they want to opt out of womanhood because when they see online what's expected of them, you know, when they, they, when they become aware of this culture as well, and it's not just, um, simply the porn thing, but also I think since uh, social media um, kind of expects this very polished, um, performative persona from girls and they can't really escape it. And I think, you know, if you don't want to look like a Kardashian and you just want to be a tomboy, mm -hmm. um, that's not being celebrated anymore by the culture like it used to be. Leisha, I think that's all we have time for. It's been a really informative interview. Thank you so much for coming in, especially on International Women's Day. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Yeah.